Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. So glad that you're here. My name is Kimberly Black, and I serve as the Director for Student Leadership Development and Strategic Initiatives here at Baylor University. I have the pleasure of moderating this afternoon's panel with Drs. Tisby and Edmondson. Um, before we get started, I'm going to read a little bit from their bios. Uh, again, not exhaustive, um, but just want to give you some highlights and then tell you how the panel is going to work. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get started. Does that sound great? Sound good? Awesome. OK. Dr. Christina Edmondson has been blessed by an array of academic, professional, and lived experiences. Christina is committed to bringing people together to promote personal and team flourishing. For over a decade, Christina has served in a variety of roles, including recently as the Dean of Intercultural Student Development at Calvin University. Within the higher education sphere, she continues to serve as an instructor and partners with several universities to develop ethical and impactful leaders. Additionally, a certified cultural intelligence facilitator, public speaker, and mental health therapist, Christina is often contacted by churches to consult about leadership development, anti-racism, and mental health issues. Her writing has been seen and referenced in a variety of outlets, including Essence.com, YourBlackWorld.com, and Gospel Today magazine. She is also one of the co-hosts of the Truth's Table podcast. Please welcome Dr. Edmondson with me. Dr. Jamar Tisby is a professor, historian, and author. He has written numerous books, including his New York Times bestselling book, The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the Church's Complicity in Racism, and How to Fight Racism. His latest book is The Spirit of Justice. Jamar has been a co-host of the Pass the Mic podcast since its, excuse me, since its inception seven years ago. His writing has been featured in the Washington Post, The Atlantic, and The New York Times, among others. He is a frequent commentator on outlets such as NPR and CNN's Newsday program. He speaks nationwide on topics of racial justice, US history, and Christianity. Jamar earned his PhD in history, studying race, religion, and social movements in the 20th century. You can follow his work through his newsletter, Footnotes, and on social media, at Jamar Tisby. Please welcome Jamar Tisby with me. We're grateful both of you all are here. Thanks for spending the afternoon with us. Uh, for the audience, we will begin our time with a 45-minute moderated discussion, followed by a 20-minute open Q&A. Behind us, you'll see QR codes where you're, uh, you can submit any questions that you might have. Uh, those questions will be sent up to me via text, so please don't judge me when I pull my phone out. Uh, <laughs> I am not texting anybody, I promise. It's what our students tell us all the time, right? Um, or my children. Um, also, too, both doctors, uh, Edmondson and Tisby, have agreed to hang out with us for a little bit post-session, so about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, we have two tables set up over here on the left. Uh, Baylor University graciously purchased 50 copies of both of their books uh, for attendees as supplies last, uh, so please do take advantage of that while you're with us. All right, y'all ready? Just a mouthful. I, they are. Free to attendees. All right. So I'm going to kick us off with an intro question. Um, a professor once told me that all research is autobiographical. With that in mind, what are some key moments in your lives that have led you to your scholarship and work? Which professor told you that? Because they might have told me the same. It actually was a professor of Elijah's. <laughs> yeah. I think that's where I heard it. And I've, I've used it before, too. Yeah. It's really interesting. If you, if you look at any scholar and their you know, research and whatnot, it probably intersects with something in their own life, which, by the way, is an argument that mitigates against the idea of pure object, objectivity, right? So uh, you know, everybody is coming with a paradigm and experiences that inform. Mine, um, <clears throat> I wrote my, I switched my dissertation topic because I was tired of writing about anti-black racism from white Christians. So my, the personal experience is I'm in the PhD program at the University of Mississippi. I was originally gonna write it on um, sort of focusing on black evangelicals, which still needs to be done, but there was a lot of it that was going to be how they were mistreated in majority white settings. And then, uh, so I switched it and I studied black Christian responses to the black power movement 
because I wanted to be black, 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 all black. I needed some relief. And uh, that was also coming off the heels of writing The Color of Compromise, which in a nutshell is about white Christians behaving badly when it comes to race. So I needed some, I needed some air <laughs> to breathe. Uh, but also I'm writing, whether scholarly or popular writing, I'm writing to the church because ultimately I want to reduce racism as a barrier to genuine uh, inclusion and belonging. So that, that kind of informs my work. For sure, it's a great question. Yeah, I mean, it, all the political is personal and all the personal is political. So um, I would say the way in which my personal narrative informs my work today is that I am a product of a posse of aunties. Uh, I, I, am, I am the, um, yeah, the expression of black women's love uh, that they pour into children. And with not the, also not to exclude the love that my dear dad also has given me and still does. Um, but my mother had a whole network of just awesome friends. And it has taken me to be 40 plus to sit down and think about really the privilege of these, um, these kindred, non-biological black women who shaped me. Um, and as they came to my home as a kid, I had no idea what they did for work. I, di I didn't know what they did in church. I just knew that they were fun and dynamic and they were nosy. And uh, so they'd ask you any question and they were like, you gonna tell me the answer? Um, and it was something about, I think, being reared in that ecosystem that has helped me to be, uh, on a good day, uh, an includer, someone who cares a lot about belonging, um, to be a person who knows that we need to, to shape our voices well, our voices have to be stewarded well, uh, and that the impact of a blessing and a curse can shape a child's life, and it can shape me into who I am today. And so the blessings of those aunties I think have been really impactful. And I think I see the work that I do now as, as, a, as a byproduct of that type of intentional love. I don't think we're ready. <laughs> I'm ready. You know, y'all are just, I'm like, where are you taking us? This is gonna be great. Okay, uh, both of y'all have spent a lot of time thinking, writing, and speaking about issues of race, higher education, and the church. Could y'all talk to us about why you think it's important for us to think about issues of institutions mm -hmm. and anti-racism together and not separately? My, my, my. I may have asked you to say, say it again. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so yeah, both of y'all have spent a lot of time thinking, writing, mm -hmm. speaking yeah. about issues of race and higher education in the church. Mm -hmm. Could y'all talk to us about why you think it's important to think about institutions and anti-racism together sure. instead of separate ideas? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, I think they go hand in hand, right? And so um, institutions in general, this is not my quote, but this is more of like an early... Uh, an early philosophical quote about kind of the inherent nature that institutions are selfish, they're self-protecting. Um, and in light of that, uh, they often become uh, the means in which uh, privileges and injustices are, are kept in place. Uh, they also, on a practical level, the way in which they are funded and supported <laughs> I mean, hello. Uh, you know, not to pick on everybody's board, but I'm just saying. Usually when I'm called into an organization, the first thing I'm gonna wanna see is who's on the board and the way in which those, how informed those voices are in the mission of justice and ethics. Um, and, and who you take your money from does matter uh, because typically it comes with a implicit or explicit list of how you can use it and who you must be in order to have it. And so institutions are funded in that way. Um, uh, now, and also, so it's hard to move them in light of that, but when they are moved, they do profound good um, and they can really shape a generation. Uh, I often talk about the impact of people who are kind of external agitators versus 
internal change agents. And internal change agents are within organizations, within institutions, and they get, they get a lot of heat. I mean, they get a lot of criticism from external agitators, right? They might even get called names sometimes um, because they're working from within in a really slow bureaucratic institution and they're trying to chip away. They're trying to chisel uh, a monument from within it, uh, which is very hard work to do uh, while holding pieces together. And external um, agitators are able to point out quickly hypocrisy, inadequacy, brokenness, right? But they don't necessarily have the currency to go about causing change from within. I would make the case that they need each other um, and then in order for institutions to move towards the ethical good, it does require often external agitators to get on their nerves. <laughs> and to remind the institution, you ought to be grateful for those internal change agents who are willing to walk with you, right? And so, and that then I think can make some movement come with the institutional context. I'm gonna just I'm gonna sigh and just sit back every time Dr. Christina speaks. It's profound. I have so much to say about institutions. Let's start with the positive. Here's here's uh, the Jamar Standard version of the positives. Um, one, institutions centralize resources. Two, institutions craft culture, and three, institutions build legacy. So I think institutions are vital for at least those three reasons, and you can add your own. But centralizing resources, institutions can get a lot more done than individuals and even loosely organized groups of individuals. Take, for example, the NAACP, which has changed over time, but let's go back to their landmark, you know, kind of highlight in the Brown v. Board case. It took an institution like the NAACP to gather the funds and a team of lawyers and test cases across the country that finally got Brown v. Board of Topeka, Kansas all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, if you had tried to do that as an individual or even as a local community, it likely wouldn't have gotten that far. So institutions can gather the resources necessary to make profound change and impact. Secondly, institutions craft culture. When you walk into an institution, there's a, a certain sense of identity. This is who we are. This is how we do things. This is who we are not. Now that doesn't always have to be negative at all. If you walk into, say, a healthy congregation, that can be a very empowering thing. Um, and then thirdly, institutions build legacy. So it outlasts an individual. I think that's critically important. There becomes institutional knowledge that is passed on from generation to generation, or even within the same era, from person to person as people come in and out of organizations. All of that being said, I have not lost faith in institutions, but I am very wary of institutions um, that did not begin with diversity in their DNA. It is extremely hard to turn the ship, and the older the institution and the larger the institution, the harder it is to turn it. So my approach for at least the past 10-ish years has been start new institutions. And we can talk more about that later. I'm gonna focus our conversation now from institutions at large to Christian institutions. Um, both of y'all um, have already expressed some of this, but what might you call out specifically as opportunities and challenges, both internal and external, around pursuing racial justice within Christian organizations and institutions? Chuckling on that, Jamar. <laughs> Spotty language is like, oh. Um, yes, opportunities are there, um, but lots of shenanigans as well. Uh, you know, I, I would, I would say, you know, uh, my, I, I worked at Calvin University, which is a definitely a Christian institution, for a number of years, and uh, uh, very similar to to, to this this uh, conference. 
highly invested in this idea of faith and learning and what that means through particular theological traditions. And I would sometimes probably get on people's nerves when I would say, well, the, you know, the Lord has blessed Christian people and this organism known as the church, not an organization, it's alive, this organism known as the church. But I don't know about your Christian shoe company, and I don't know about your Christian media company, and I don't know about your Christian school, because that is a bar, and I'm saying that really to agitate, I'm not saying you shouldn't pursue this goal. I'm saying it to agitate, because when you take the, the, the adjective of Christian with something, you are taking the burden, it's a burden, to attach Jesus's identity, his ethics, his way of being with an institution. And I think that's a lofty and an ambitious thing to do. Uh, and obviously there are many institutions who have done such and will continue to do, but I think um, it is sobering to do that. And I think uh, within that title, within that, uh, that genre, that category, right, of, of institution, it has built into it either an opportunity for great growth, growth in a moral system or a constant holy finger pointed at hypocrisy. And so I, I would just be careful. <laughs> I would just be careful about attaching uh, Jesus's way with institutions that are not fully bought into what does that mean constantly, and then recognizing that that obviously is going to be imperfect, but that holy finger is going to be still pointing along the way. So that, that, that's my initial thoughts about that. Yeah, absolutely. What did I say? That's, that's, yeah. um, what are some of the opportunities and challenges, both internal and external, of pursuing racial justice at Christian organizations and institutions? I think the challenge is a lot of Christian institutions, when it comes to racial and ethnic diversity, are trying to retrofit their institutions for diversity when they were never designed with diversity in mind. And it may not have been something outright malicious. It just wasn't on the radar. And now you're, you know, have you ever, you ever tried to like, I don't know if anybody can afford a house these days, but hypothetically, if you ever try to like remodel a house, and add something that wasn't there originally, it's tricky to do. Can it be done? Yeah, but it's gonna be very costly. And you might have to end up knocking down walls and putting, pulling out pipes and rearranging stuff that you never planned on rearranging in order to make it work. So there's an opportunity there because if you can add that, oh my, this would be amazing, an amazing dwelling but too few are willing to pay the cost. Here's the thing, the obsession with growth and size prohibits many institutions from changing because the reality is if many Christian, let's say Christian colleges and universities wanted to truly change to become welcoming places for all kinds of people, they would lose money and constituents. But are we okay with that? Like, isn't it theoretically better to be smaller and healthy than larger and unhealthy? But we don't really have that calculus in institutions a lot of times. I mean, I, you know, I was, the, the so, so what are the unique assets or the things that are in the toolbox, potentially, if they would open it up, of a Christian institution, if they don't open it up, right? And I would say that in the life and person of Jesus, uh, we have uh, we've been given a tremendous imagination for what ethics can look like, for uh, the beauty of teaching, uh, the beauty of inclusion. I think uh, the uh, the beauty of belonging, um, the the necessary courage that an institution needs or that students need to be offered, take courage. Um, that is in that toolbox if we'd open it up, right? And to Jamar's point, it is costly to do such, but the resources are there. And I think, again, that's what I mean by attaching Christian to anything. You, okay, now you're gonna, take, you're gonna take the name of Christ, but you're gonna take the way of Christ. And the way of Christ is one that does come with it suffering, yeah. suffering. Um, and 
and I'm not, I'm not attempting to deify suffering. I sure enough don't like to suffer at all. Um, but I recognize that that is a part of the faith tradition. And so if people cannot tolerate a plucky letter, you know, whether it be from a parent or someone on a board, then we're not, we're not gonna have the moral strength to match the Christian name with the Christian way in the institution. But, but the resources are in the toolbox. Yes. Yes. They are in there. But also there's a reminder in that toolbox that this is going to be hard. And before you grow wide, you have to grow deep. Mm -hmm. And I think the opportunity is, is witness. So when a Baylor, when a congregation, when a denomination not only claims the name of Christ, but the way of Christ, I like how you're preaching up here, that, that becomes a beacon. We know very clearly and tragically how many people are repelled by the behavior of people who call themselves Christians. What if Christians inst Christian institutions actually followed the way of Christ? I think the opportunity there is witness. It's, it's, it's attractive, um, literally bringing people to the institution, bringing people to the culture. And that's the beautiful opportunity there. One of the things that I think institutions miss is in their fear of losing an existing constituency, they overlook the constituency they might gain by standing for justice, right? So we'll, we'll lose you know, this generation of people or people with this much wealth, but by standing up for justice, by demonstrating righteousness, you're actually gonna draw a whole new group of people who will bring new life, new energy, new ideas, perhaps even new resources to the institution. That's great, thank you. We're gonna look at this idea of witness a little bit more deeply. How might we discern when an institution's commitment to racial, racial diversity is genuine rather than merely performative or reliant on tokenism? I'm gonna tee up Dr. Christina on here. I think, um, I think a, a great barometer is uh, the experiences of black women in an organization. Uh, it's been my experience, especially in Christian churches and institutions, that even someone like me, a black male, I can have entree onto stages and into leadership because of my maleness, even though race is gonna be an issue. But if you talk to someone at the intersection, intersectionality of race and gender, race and sexism, right? They'll have a, a much more robust view of how uh, an, or, an, an institution is, is embodying certain practices around equity and whatnot. So it, I think the general principle is to go to the people in an institution who are uh, least powerful, um, who have relatively less influence, how is their experience? That's the barometer, not the ones who are at the top or most empowered. No, I think that's I think that's spot on, and and, and just a word for the necessity of understanding intersectional and connecting identities. It's the rich young ruler for a purpose. It's a compounding identity which which shaped him in a particular way, that made him walk away sad. So scripture offers us layered identities because they matter. <laughs> they matter. So just wanted to add that to what you said. Um, uh, but uh, so to Jamar's point, absolutely. We're gonna look at who is most decentered or marginalized in, in that institution to hear what they have to say and what their experience might be there. Um, you know, I would say that one of the things I'm gonna be looking for for it to go past just performance into something that is truly missional, is that um, they, everyone is being equipped in the way of hospitality. Um, and so you, you ha we have to expect that people are going to be products of their socialization and their environment. Um, and I don't have to agree with someone to, to still have a degree of empathy and understanding for how they got to the position in, or the worldview that they have. And so the institution, um, I think, needs to be committed to a type of uh, educational hospitality 
that instead of kind of pushing people away who just don't get it, they really work hard um, as an academic institution to assess where people are in their understanding, what are the roots of their understanding, and help to guide people in ways that are developmentally appropriate, evidence-based, you name it, <laughs> so that we can walk together as far as we can walk. Um, I do think there are real consequences, and I understand the temptation, and some people do need just, they need some good firm boundaries around them, because when you show out, you need good boundaries around you. Um, but uh, we, we cannot just so quickly cut people off. Um, that fuels the polarization that we see right now. And I, and I would say that is not the way of, of Christ. Now, the way of Christ does include boundary setting, absolutely. But I do think as far as people are willing from a co-belligerent standpoint, as far as people are willing to walk together as we learn about each other, let's walk together as much as we can. And educators, I think, have a unique role in that. It's a, it's a hard job, um, but they have an opportunity and administrators in, in these institutions have an opportunity to teach people how to walk together. And you gotta be well enough to do that. I'm gonna be quiet. You gotta be well enough to do that. You have to have the emotional regulation, the health, the boundary setting, the breaks, the meditation. You have to be mentally well enough to walk with people who disagree about things that really matter, including the value of your own identity. Not everybody is equipped or suited to do that, and I would propose to you that no one is suited to do that forever. That's seasonal work. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait, run that back. Say it one more time. That's seasonal work. <laughs> you said so tag much. Tag team, tag team. Like, uh, the, the, you know, I used to watch the Wrestling Federation oh, as a yeah. kid. You gotta, oh, yeah. you gotta know when it's time for you to get out the ring. You know, you gotta tag somebody so else So that's for the inside change agents. That's the inside change agents, for sure. So if it's seasonal, does that mean leaving the organization, staying within it, putting the work down for a time? What does it look like to honor that season? I mean, I think there's some different ways to do that, all the above that you just said. Mm -hmm. I think we both know that there are academics, particularly academics of color, who, who truly love the study of something related to their own ethnicity and culture. And then there are others who may be studying something that's not specifically related to that. And they may have found themselves tracked I mean, that would never happen at Baylor, but they would find themselves tracked into a very specific place, right? And I would say for some people, that, that seasonal break could be returning to, to, to some other aspect of the work, right? You know, someone has, has, a, has a particular degree, and next thing they know, 10 years in their career, they're the head of the you know, diversity task force. That may not have been their passion point, their skill set, or their interest. They care. Um, and so I would say that's, and that's the kind of thing that fatigues people. It wears them down at their core. And if that's not, again, your calling, your training, then you should change seasons into something else. And the institution needs to respect that, that type of emotional labor. So let me say this. When you said um, questions on that paper. respecting <laughs> I think you said something about respecting like the social formation that, that people came through. So, so we know yeah. there are gonna be folks who grew up with racism in, in their context, right? I explicit take the, racism. What, explicit. Explicit racism, right. Which, you know, in their, as it's been passed on to them or as they've processed it, comes out not as overt, you know, they're not calling people names or intentionally barring people from positions, but they're gonna look with skepticism, if not outright rejection, on DEI efforts and efforts to move the racial and diverse, ethnic diversity needle in a, in a positive direction. I have, I have the Motel 6 philosophy of, we'll leave the light on for you. So I am willing to have that conversation with anyone wherever they're at in their journey. If they're brand new, if they have just heard about, you know, just heard that racism is still a problem in 2024, I will talk to you. Um, it's the arrogance, the certainty with which people hold some of these ideas that I feel like I've, I need to draw a boundary 
What, how, how would you counsel me there? <laughs> this is awesome. I'm, <laughs> you know what I was thinking, Dr. Tisby. And you indeed are here, by the way. Yeah, um, I, 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 was, I was thinking, of, as you were talking, I was thinking about emotional intelligence research. And, and oftentimes it is the things that people know the least about mm -hmm. that, they, that they actually think that they know the most about. You know, you, you, you can ask somebody like, you know, could you f fix a car engine? And I'm like, yeah, I can Google stuff. Maybe I can figure it out. And then I actually pop the hood of my car, you know, and I start to really look at it. And I'm like, they are these people called professionals. Yeah. Yeah. And I need to put some respect on their name, you know, and, um, and, and not me. That's yeah. not what I do. Right. And so I do think um, I do think that 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 haughtiness yeah. where people feel like they got it and they don't necessarily recognize that. Uh, <laughs> That, that social science is something that we study. Yes. <laughs> like we study that, y'all. And um, shout out to the social scientists <laughs> in the room. Um, and so, yes, I do think people feel like they've got all they need. They've got all they need. They've got the understanding. And then here's the other part. Their understanding came from likely family of origin, Sunday school teacher, favorite pastor, you name it, right? And so when people start to shift and to see something different, well, that comes with some emotional cost and cut. It's like, man, grandmama was racist. I love grandmama, but yeah. she's racist, right? Yeah. Um, and, and people oftentimes don't know how to carry that. It takes, it takes some developmental growth. You know, it's like my, when I worked with undergraduate students in counseling, uh, when I was functioning as a counselor at Vanderbilt and other spaces, and I remember students, their first, uh, first semester, they realized like, my parents are ridiculous. These people are hard to live with. I'm glad I'm not here. They would have this kind of epiphany, right? Uh -huh. And then they would go home for Thanksgiving and then it was like, it's a big fight at the table and the parents are like, where did I send you to school? You're awful now. You know, all these things are coming out. And then typically, unless there's some real significant trauma stuff, by the end of their college journey, they're like, come over here, mom, get in this picture. Come on, dad, put this cap on your head. I love you. <laughs> and what has happened is that they have recognized the deep flaws of their parents. And now they're able to hold that with the beauty of their parents. Mm. That takes a, that takes a uh, uh, maturity. It takes a journey, yeah. Yeah. even within ourselves, to be able to hold our good and bad together. And so I think when we're talking about folks who are kind of haughty, like we got it, we know what we're doing on these issues or these topics, or, or this is not a big deal, or why are you talking about it? They're gonna have to go through that developmental journey. And, and it doesn't matter how old they are. If they have not started it, then it's, it's like them being all the way back at the very beginning stage. Y'all, y'all, tee me up. Are you ready? Okay, because yeah. I have, I have, a, I have a question. Um, you a can hop questions, in, actually. please. No, <laughs> for sure. Um, Others as so well. I love both of y'all have spent some time talking about the power, really, of storytelling, and the power that stories hold and have, and the stories we share and we don't share, and how honest and truthful we are about our stories. Can you tell us um, about how storytelling, uh, personal, communal? honest and less honest impacts institutions hmm. and impacts the experiences of the, the people whose stories uh, aren't told or are held within an institution. Again, Baylor's going through a, a, a reckoning around storytelling as well right now in, in our history, right? And uh, tell us a little bit, if you could, about the power of true stories and uh, storytelling within institutions. Hmm. I focus on story because it's personal. So we're, we're in an era where things like social science and expertise is being questioned, right? So the very process that folks need to undergo to start to understand racial and ethnic diversity in a more healthy way, they are repelling the tools that would help them do that. So if you offer a program or a book or listen to this person, they're gonna, it, it's really easy for people who are resistant to sort of um, dismiss those voices. What's, what's a little bit harder to dismiss, it still happens, but it's a little bit harder, is, is your story. Um, yesterday, uh, someone asked a question about, you know, how do you talk to someone, whether in your family or in a professional setting, who is resistant to these ideas of racial progress? And I said, begin with your personal testimony. Going back to, to church days, I remember in uh, you, you know evangelism training when that was a thing. 
you, you talked about your conversion story. And you basically what that was, was how did you encounter Christ? How did you encounter this way of life? And what was it that, that brought you in? I think there's a similar conversion story, if you will, for people who are passionate about racial justice. There was something in your journey, something in your autobiography that made you care. Maybe it was a series of events, maybe it was a person, maybe it was a horrific incident, right? But I tell people, get really good at telling that story um, because that's more approachable. It's harder to argue with your own experience. Whether it's persuasive or not is another matter. The other thing I focus on is historical truth telling which is simply historical storytelling. His, history is simply stories. That's why I find it so fascinating. The other reason I find it fascinating is it's true stories because people can say what they believe all day long, but history has the receipts because you show what you believe by what you actually do. So in The Color of Compromise, my first book, it was so impactful for people because I didn't have to be very uh, didactic in it. I could just tell the story of the Virginia Assembly in 1667 passing a law that said baptism would not emancipate an enslaved African, Native American, or mixed race person. I can just lay that on you and you feel the burden of that story. That's why I love history to, to help us understand why institutions must change, how they can change, because if we tell the story of how institutions got it both wrong and right, I think that sits different, it weighs differently than a lot of empirical data, which is helpful, uh, but just to connect to someone, because it, I think at the end of the day, story is effective because so much of what we're dealing with isn't just head, it's heart, and the stories connect on that heart level. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I was, I was thinking about story as being what is the fabric of our identities, whether those are true stories or false stories. They still, the way they weave together to make us into kind of who we are, the story of, of, of me and the story of you. And I think when we, when we don't give people room and space for their story, we don't make room for them. And so that's, that's why it's necessary to, for institutions to do honest storytelling about who, 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 who have we not spoken about? Uh, what, did, what did we take out you know, of the narrative? And, um, and, and making space for it, and making space for the pain and the emotions and the distrust and the frustration that come with that. But I would say on the other side of it, there's an opportunity for greater credibility um, if we would persevere in that work. And then also, obviously, as we're thinking about telling people's stories, it requires us to hear people's stories, right? And so I think it is very tempting to co-op uh, people's right to share their own story. Um, but to whatever extent we can give people the microphone to express their own narratives, we should do that. Even if it's gonna require us to be stretched because they don't do it in the way that we would, might do it, right? So. Um, I think that's incredibly important. And, and the, the, the journey uh, of how we got here for each institution really does offer an opportunity. Uh, one, as a, a high level academic endeavor of scholarship, but also an opportunity to do some healing and some mending. And it sends a message to current students that your story now matters and you are a part of the fabric of this institution and what it is going to become. I'm gonna ask one more question and then shift to the questions y'all have submitted. So please feel free to continue to send questions there. Again, Elijah is sending them to me as you submit them, so please feel free to continue to do that. Um, for both of y'all, what are your hopes and fears for current as well as fu future racial justice movements? You picked up that mic, go ahead. <laughs> my, my hopes are that um, racial justice movements become uh, more multiracial and multi-ethnic in character, and we're seeing more inter-ethnic solidarity. Uh, so it was really interesting in 2020 with the, the George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor protests, there were some marches and protests that were like all white people. 
That did not happen in the civil rights movement. And um, all kinds of people, even globally, uh, participated in support of black lives, right? So I think that is a direction, that is a positive uh, step in uh, the movement for racial justice, is that the movement itself becomes more diverse. I think the danger is we underestimate or overlook the importance of the black Christian tradition in that. And I think that's even among black people. Um, I keep saying this, the black church gets a lot wrong because the black church, like every other church, has people in it. But we can be smart and savvy and say when it comes to this race thing, the black church has a lot to say that's good and helpful. Uh, we do ourselves a disservice to overlook that legacy and that tradition and even the ongoing relevance of the black church as in its institutional form to gather resources, build culture, build legacy, right? Uh, so I think right now we need courage because as I look at the landscape of the broad swath of history, but also the last 16 to 18 years as well, it's action and reaction. It's progress and regress. And no sooner do we have these historic marches in 2020, than you get a January 6th insurrection, then you get anti-DEI, anti-CRT, anti-wokeism, so to say. And if we're not prepared for that backlash, we won't persist, and that's my concern. Do we have the resilience to keep going, especially when it looks like we're not winning? There is nothing in scripture and nothing in experience that says that because you want justice, you'll get it. That doesn't mean you give up. If the people who came before us, the black Christians like I study in my book, The Spirit of Justice, if they had quit, I wouldn't be on this stage. And we inherit a sacred debt to continue their struggle. And not only looking backwards, but looking forward to the people who come after us. What do we want to leave them? And I think um, I want the people of God to be tough. And I want us to understand that justice is not just about the changes you make in the world, but the changes that happen in you. My last sermon point is this. Um, the longer I do this work, the more I see that there is virtue simply in pursuing justice, whether or not you get justice. What do I mean? There is virtue in pursuing justice because it makes you the kind of person who pursues justice. It makes you a person of courage. It makes you a person of integrity. It makes you a person of kindness. And I dare to believe that Jesus is just as concerned about the changes that we make in the world as the changes that happen in us. And if we don't honor that shift in our souls that become more like Jesus, we won't have the toughness to endure in this struggle. Ditto, ditto. Uh, as you were talking, uh, Dr. Tisby, I was thinking about, yeah, what it means to uh, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, and, and to see those, um, those three categories as expressions and means of sanctification for the believer. That there is something um, otherworldly that's breaking in that is happening as we do justice, as we attempt 
uh, to make right the wicked and crooked ways, knowing that we can't do it in our own strength, but there's something that's happening in us as, as we do that. We are being changed to your point. Yeah, so I mean, I, 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 think, we, I think we show up because we are worth showing up. <laughs> and our neighbors are worth showing up for. <laughs> and sometimes as a Christian, I mean, a lot of things we do just because the Lord said do it. And you don't always get your, I mean, you don't always get your why. You don't. You don't always get your why, not, not exactly when you want it. Um, and that is what grows faith. That's what grows faith. Um, so no, I, I yeah. Ditto to what you might just say. Our first question is going to pick up uh, kind of with what you were talking about, Dr. Chisney, about courage, uh, especially within the Christian university context. Uh, one of the questions uh, we got says, some Christian universities are becoming even more protective of white privilege to the point where merely quoting or assigning a brief reading from an author's book who may or may not be on the stage <laughs> That's can get someone yeah. fired. <laughs> Uh, how can we not allow this to spread within Christian higher education institutions? Oof. So if you don't know the story, there are several professors who have gotten in trouble just for having my book. In one case, just a quote on their syllabus. So it was Julie Moore, Taylor University, wrote all about it, was public. And um, administration caught wind because one student or one parent complained. And this is often the case. And then uh, she has a meeting with the provost, basically says your contract is not being renewed after she had gone through the process with her department where all of her colleagues agreed, yeah, come on, she'd been there already, I think, for seven years. It wasn't new. And it says it's not being renewed, and she pressed her provost on why. And he hadn't done his research. It goes back to the arrogance and the confidence when you know nothing. He hadn't read this. He read the first page of the syllabus on which uh, she had quoted one sentence from the introduction of The Color of Compromise. And he said, well, well, it's that Jamar Tisby that you have in your class. And she didn't even assign the book. She just quoted me. And that was enough. So what's happening is compromise and complicity. So what I said the other day is uh, most of my speaking gigs used to be at Christian colleges and universities, but not anymore. Not anymore. And there are some that are extreme far right and don't want to have the conversation. But I would say the majority, the reason why they're not inviting me is because they don't want the controversy. They don't want to be labeled woke or as teaching critical race theory. So they don't want someone like me that others could look at the event or the talk and put a label on them. So it's fear, it's so much of it. And that's how injustice perpetuates. Um, I, I, I write about Charles Morgan Jr. who was a white lawyer and in the wake of the 16th Street Baptist church bombing, he asked this group of all white businessmen, who did it, who threw that bomb? And he said, the answer should be all of us. Now there were only a few people implicated in actually planting the dynamite that killed those four little girls, but Birmingham had already earned the nickname Bombingham. So what he was saying is, why didn't we speak up before? Why didn't we come alongside in solidarity the victims of other bombings? Because if we had spoken up before, maybe this wouldn't have happened. So this is what's happening in the Christian church and it has happened for centuries. Is this small, extreme, loud, violent group intimidates the majority. And if you allow yourself to be intimidated, you become part of the problem. Okay, thank you for that. Don't become a part of that group. <laughs> <laughs> Period. And ask the Lord to you Here's ask where courage. the Lord to search you. <laughs> we know this from experience. Here's where the rubber hits the road with courage. It will cost you. So look, look, the reason why I study white Christian nationalism is it explained my experience. I had been talking about race and religion publicly since 2011. Then 
June 2015, a certain candidate comes down the escalators of his own hotel. I have no idea who that is. I have is. no idea, you know, just in general, right? <laughs> and we see this slate of two dozen hopefuls get whittled down to the one. And in the midst of it, a lot of people who have been historically on the margins, women, black people, LGBTQ people, the poor, like jumping up and down saying, yo, this is not gonna be good. And so I say this on Facebook or something like that. I get called in by the elders of my church because one person said, hey, he's, this is your intern, he's getting too political. Mind you, he had posted plenty in favor of this candidate, wasn't a problem, right? So that happens. Um, there's a podcast I do in the wake of the 2016 election. Um, I had been scheduled to preach at two different places. They both rescinded their invitations, including my home church. I had been scheduled to speak at a couple different places. They rescinded their invitations. So what I'm trying to tell you is you might lose your job. So what? Do you believe Jesus or not? Is Jesus going to take care of you or not? I didn't have health care for five, six years. Jesus said, Joshua 1, verse 9, be strong and courageous. And he attached a promise to it. I will be with you wherever you go. And you know what happened in the New Testament? Someone was born and they called him Emmanuel, God with you. So here's what I'm saying. Are you a Christian? Because if you are, you have to believe Jesus' promise that Jesus will be with you. And if we get so attached to the title we have, the role we have, the money we have, the status we have, that's why Jesus tells us again and again and again, be courageous. Don't be afraid. Now, the opportunity is witness. Then we start living like lights in the world. And people say, where do you get that boldness? Where do you get that courage? And Jesus said, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. And you'll say, Jesus is with me. And you'll say, oh, you're one of those religious people. He's like, no, I'm one of those Jesus people. Would you like to know about him? I'm sorry. All right. All right, y'all, um, let's talk for a second about black institutions. Higher education or otherwise have historically served to support marginalized communities. Could y'all discuss the role of these institutions in combating racism? Maybe what is unique about the contribution, uh, either one. Yeah, sure, I mean, and, I, and again, they're not all they're not all cookie cutter, certainly not all the same, but so I'm a, I am a two-time graduate of historically black college and university. In between there, I went to a large, fairly affluent, they got money, predominantly white institution, University of Rochester in upstate New York. But, but, it's, but it's sandwiched between two historically black universities. And um, I am incredibly grateful for not only the education that took place in the classroom, um, but the education that just took that's like in the ecosystem. So I, I have an assumption that black people and black women specifically are in leadership positions. I think something is wrong with your institution if I don't see black women in leadership positions because uh, I'm like, well, you are missing out. <laughs> What's happening here? You know, so, um, and, and again, I think because of, of being taught uh, and being uh, led by uh, people of color, uh, and, and even, even my professors who were not African-American, I certainly had many non-African-American professors, they were all people who were committed to the project. The project was uh, the advancement, the empowerment um, of people of African descent. And so, uh, so my Jewish professor was committed to that project. You know, my professors of different backgrounds were committed to that, and, and it showed up in the classroom. It showed up in the, in the examples that they used. And so they weren't stretching and reaching for some kind of, let, let me just, let me add this sprinkle of diversity. 
<laughs> that's just not what was happening, right? And they knew that it was necessary for me to see myself in whatever field or profession that I, I would go into. So super grateful for that. I would say this. The, one of the biggest issues with uh, these institutions are it's about money. I mean, because that's what racialization is about, is about money. And, um, and so this is where we see the tension. This is where we see the struggles. This is where we see the frustration. Uh, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Tennessee State University is a historically black public university. It is owed millions of dollars by the state. It is owed the kind of money that would change the entire neighborhood of where it's situated. Now, it's, its sister institution, institutions, which are large, predominantly white public institutions in the state of Tennessee have such resources. And the neighborhoods and the institutions look like it. And so I would say I, I have heard people of all backgrounds, including black folks, that will critique uh, an institution like Tennessee State University, like, oh, well, this should be like this, and why don't they have this, and why don't they have that? I'm like, let me tell you something. I can run things a whole lot better when I got a lot of money. I mean, money is money's really helpful. It is, it is not the end all be all, but if you have an organization issue, if you have a, uh, you know, just a, a building maintenance issue, you need money. You need money to fix those things. And so I, I do think that uh, these historic, historically black institutions are oftentimes um, unfairly judged because they do not have within them the same resources, which means they don't put out the same product in the same way the institutions that have more affluence do. And that just seems like obvious to me, but because of the internalization of racism and because of just racism in general, people do not, um, that is not as obvious to people. It is not as obvious to people. And because we've not done our work that we need to in rejecting racist mythology and lies, we are more likely to blame the people that run the institution than we are to blame the state that owes them millions of dollars. And so I think we have to remember that part of the story and that part of the narrative as well. Can I just add some data to back that up? Number one, a quick story. Part of what got Brown v. Board all the way to the Supreme Court was challenging Plessy v. Ferguson specifically on the, on the equal part of separate but equal. What the plan was by white racists was to fully fund two separate public school systems. We can't even adequately fund one. But the idea was black students can have their schools, white students will have their schools, they'll be equally funded, everybody will be happy. Well, the equal funding never happened. And that's actually what they brought up in court. They weren't saying, hey, let's get together with white people, by the way, Black people, we're not just so desperate to sit next to white people in class, right? That's, that's not what was behind it. That's the, that's the mythology of, of integration. That's, that's the story that Talk we tell it. because of this kind of racialized narcissism. Mm. What black people wanted was they wanted what was due to them, and still is, by the way, reparations now. But, <laughs> I mean, it's just true. It's just true. We can go back in time and fix that. I would love to do it. That's the power of repentance. Repentance means that you can dust off that old stuff and you can receive the grace of changing it today. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. We should invest in that. Christians should lead that movement. Um, but sorry to cut you off. I just I was, no, on, I, I was on one right so there. So I, I, I just wanted to throw that in quickly and then add some data to what you said. So um, HBCUs punch above their weight. I'm now the product of two HBCUs. My graduate, uh, my first graduate course in history was at Jackson State University HBCU, and now I'm teaching at an HBCU, Simmons College of Kentucky in Louisville. And HBCUs comprise 3% of all colleges and universities, and this is data from the White House Proclamation on HBCUs in 2022. Uh, these 3% of schools produce 40% of all, 20% of all black graduates, 40% of all black engineers, 50% of all black lawyers, 70% of black doctors attended an HBCU, and 80% of black judges attended an HBCU. That's not all. When you're talking about the money, if you add up the endowments of the top 10 predominantly white institutions, colleges, it totals $321.6 billion. If you did the same thing with HBCU endowments, it totals just $2.2 billion. At 
as we speak now, there are 139 PWIs with endowments above 1 billion, 139. As we speak now, there are zero HBCUs above 1 billion. When I talked about that top 10 PWI, top 10 HBCU, when we break it down, the discrepancy is $128.7 to one. So you talked about reparations. Share your endowment. Super practical. Super practical. Super painful, but super practical. Yeah. And to the painful part, and to the painful part, it can be if the top ten PWIs shared a fraction of one percent of their endowment with all one hundred one HBCUs, it would be a transformative amount for those colleges and universities. So it wouldn't even be painful for the PWIs. And I would probably start with the institutions that are partly where they are because of the slave trade. That would be a great criteria to decide, you know what, we should do something about that. But see, there's the thing of <laughs> personal responsibility, right? So it, it, it has taken historic and tragic incidences to get places like Georgetown, Princeton, Harvard to even have the conversation. And when they do, it's only about what our institution did. So it, it, there's not the sense of, we could share this with all HBCUs. Um, and I think we need to get beyond that because again, the power of institutions to centralize resources, they could do literally with one document and some signatures, what it would take tens of thousands of people donating to do. So where is the will? That is I don't the know. I mean, did those people work hard for <laughs> it? And is it going to cause them to have a delayed work ethic? And blah, 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 blah. Because, you know, out. all of our money we worked hard to get. Yeah. So the, that, that racist lie and mythology, it, it is a stronghold. Colossians talks about the fact that we have to see to it that we're not taken captive by such ideologies. In our day and age, one of those is white supremacy. And it will cause you to say such foolishness like that. And it will... It will, uh, you will suffer from not fully repenting when you could. All right, y'all, I'm gonna try to pull two questions together, all right? Hang, hang in there, audience and uh, panelists. Please try to hang in with me. So we've talked a lot about internal change agents, external agitators, the role you both have played, right, as in both positionalities. I kind of feel like you're in both spaces right now, maybe a little bit too. Yeah, so um, y'all have had to make choices, right? Like, do we stay in, do we jump out, do we straddle, right? Like both of these things. Y'all have also created your own institutions. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Dr. Tisby, you have The Witness, uh, a black Christian collective, pass the mic. Dr. Edmondson, you have The Truth Table. Um, could y'all share your motivations for creating mm. institutions? Mm. And what has surprised you in creating and maintaining those? And maybe also speak to some of the moments you were talking about, like wh how do, when do I stay in yeah. and when do I jump out, right? Like what, when do I create something new? When is that gonna move the needle? Sorry, I told you it was gonna be lots of questions and one. So. I'll try to be brief. The, 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 the witness started out as the Reformed African American Network. I was waving the banner for these white Christian institutions. <laughs> they should have been happy I was there. They should have been like, ooh, look, try to put him on every really brochure. Look, they fumbled the bag. Um, listen, we listen. started talking about racial justice, and that was a bridge too far, and blah, blah, blah. So in 2017, we changed the name to The Witness, a black Christian collective. We was like, we, we, we got to let folk know this black. And, and, and why we did that was we wanted black people to know this was a safe space for them. This wasn't another place you were going to get re-traumatized, right? So we wanted that clear in the name. Um, so the reason we formed uh, what was at the time ran was simply to be another voice at the white evangelical and reformed table and to be like, hey, we, can, we have something to contribute to. And then we found out they didn't want us at the table. So we said, we'll build our own. And that's why we did that. But I'll tell you the closest 
I came to quitting this thing and changing careers was in 2019, when after years of people asking us, we finally put on our first national conference. And I kid you not, the stress of trying to raise $75,000 for that conference almost took me out. It wasn't until two weeks before that we even knew we could pay the honoraria for the guests, the, the speakers that we had invited. And 75K, you know, it ain't nothing, but it ain't a lot when you talk about institutions, when you talk about some conferences and whatnot. But the reason why it was so hard was, uh, you say, all money ain't good money. Or what did you say? It's probably more snazzy than that. Um, <laughs> So we wouldn't take it from every white evangelical institution that could have given. We don't know that they would have, but we knew what they stood for on race. And it wasn't, it's not like we were gonna go to an outright overtly racist organization, but we knew the organizations that weren't doing enough. We also knew the organizations that were platforming outright racists, having them write on their blogs, speak at their conferences, and we weren't gonna partner with them. Uh, so the challenge of institutions has always, just like the HBCUs, has been funding. Um, but we need them because I'm a historian and I want there to be a legacy. I want there to be a paper trail. We were here. That the white Christian nationalists get all the headlines, all the buzz, all the airtime right now, but there was another witness. Yeah, so I serve right now as CEO for True Sable Foundation. It is an organization that is dedicated to uh, women of African descent throughout the diaspora that focuses on both their, the parallel of their spiritual and vocational development together. We believe that when black women are given the microphone and empowered to lead, they save democracies. And whether you believe you need that now, y'all need that now. Um, <laughs> So, I, I mean, that's not our primary mission. We feel like that's incredibly important for the moment that we're in. I, I don't think of myself as a very dramatic communicator. I really do, to use violent language, shoot straight. We, we have to have people who are actually committed to the democracy project. And if you look at the data, we have many people who aren't committed to democracy. <laughs> I, you know, uh, if, if there's ever a person who, uh, in terms of my... Uh, the, my cultural legacy in this country. It wouldn't be odd for me to say like, you know what, sometimes the majority are just terrible. Because sometimes the majority have been absolutely terrible. And yet I'm still committed to, de to the democracy project in the United States. And what we are seeing in the data is this, these different groups of Christians that are becoming less and less committed to the democracy project. Now, why ever could that be? Because when there are more people that you don't want to be in that project, then all of a sudden you become more comfortable with things like the notion of a king. Hmm. And so our organization says uncomfortable truths um, all the time. <laughs> and we want black women to be protected and empowered because we believe that when they are, it is good for their neighbors. Yeah. That the, the, and that doesn't mean that we think that there's some special magical group amongst other people. But what we have learned through history is that their ethics and political imagination is hardly ever self-centered. Yes. It is hardly ever self-centered. Right. And so as I'm voting, I am thinking about the missing indigenous women that we're not talking about. As I'm voting, I am thinking about that Haitian child who is going to school, who was already getting teased, who was already getting mistreated. But there now there's a whole new line of, of jokes and ridicule because someone who is situated in the highest office of our land thought that that would be a good political strategy. So when we show up, I believe when black Christian women, especially throughout the world, show up empowered, we show up not just thinking about ourselves. And if we are, may we be rebuked and remember our neighbors. Y'all.
Um, I had the impossible task of choosing between amazing questions. So thank you all for just, for, again, you had such great questions and for making my job difficult. Um, please do, also these guys, no, I'm just kidding. You guys did a great job. Um, could you all please do uh, join me again in thanking Jamar and Christina for joining us this afternoon.